Hello everyone and welcome to part two of the uh, Sackets SM challenge solution stream. So this is a continuation of a stream I did um, on Sunday and I will be going through uh, the challenges of Sackets SM, so the Swedish uh, IT security uh, championships, which is a high school uh, targeted CTF competitions for uh, beginners and uh, the idea is that I'm uh, solving the challenges without really having um, solved them before. Um, I might through some discussions with the other organizers have a little bit of background knowledge about some of the challenges but in general I have not attempted uh, these challenges. So uh, last time and I will link to that uh, as well you can find it on this channel. Um, we did all of the uh, introduction and miscellaneous challenges, uh, all but one of the web challenges and all of the reverse engineering challenges. So today uh, we will be moving on with the other uh, categories and uh, hopefully manage through all of them, but uh, we'll see, we'll go on for a while. And uh, please let me know in the chat if uh, there are any technical problems, like is the sound okay? Uh, also, if you have any questions, if you want to, um, you know, ask about any details or want me to go into yeah, more about some topic, uh, please uh, let me know in the chat. And uh, well, let's let's get started with the Ponable uh, challenge. So here we have this uh, first uh, challenge. So like a decent calculator. And so the, this competition is, I mean, it was a Swedish competition uh, targeted towards Swedish high school students. So some of the challenges and descriptions are in, in Swedish, but they are perfectly solvable uh, either way. So uh, this challenge, which was solved by uh, 31 teams, um, we are only given an IP address and a port. So first of all, let's just set the... Um, Okay, so let's create the directory for this, bring up some notes, make sure we have a decent text size so that you can see this and if the, if the text is uh, readable or not. So let's use netcat to um, wait a second, am I in the wrong? Oh, sorry. Um, one moment. Uh, I was in the uh, repository of the actual, like all the challenges, not my solutions. Okay, so now we have some notes in a file in the correct directory. And we let's try to connect to this service using netcat as we talked about. So just TCP connection, this IP and the port. So here calculator, which we can use. So let's just try like type one, one plus one is two. Okay, what if we do something like strange, just like zero divided by zero, we get an error. So it says, um, some error in this uh, module and we can see some python code and this is like a this is an error from from python so we know that this is uh python code um so uh, the the input we're given is how much we can see actually the input given uh, the the code that is run here uh like eval of the expression so it seems like um the, the our input that we provide uh, passed to the eval function and that is of course as we know very so how do we do we do this specifically in python then to uh, uh, take control i mean what we want to do i mean the easy thing we want to do is just get to get the shell or something and we can then use uh, there's the import function oh sorry we need to uh, i mean the program crashed uh, break the connection and 
connect again. So when you, in Python, when you import a library, you usually write something like this. Um, to facilitate this, there is like an internal, like a built-in function uh, called import, but it's called like underscore, underscore, import, underscore, underscore. But you can call this function directly. And what we'll do is we, we can use this to like import a library, for example, the OS library. And that, was give, give, that will give us back uh, a module uh, object. Uh, and from this module object, we can run uh, functions on this. So we could run the system function. Uh, so we can see here that if we type this, we get access to the system function. Um, and then finally, we can then run just like launch bin slash sh. And we should now have a shell, so we should be able to type ls, which we can, and then we can do cat flag dot txt. So that's the um, that's the solution to this challenge, uh, and um, this <clears throat> whole family of uh, challenges is, I mean, this is a like the uh, almost trivial example of this type of challenge, but generally this is typically called like a jail. So you're given some environment where you are allowed to execute some kind of code. Uh, typically, as the name implies, a jail has some kind of restrictions. So maybe there's like some blacklist or whitelist and you need to like use this to um, break out of the jail to like run commands that you were not supposed to do. In this case, there weren't really any, any uh, limitations at all so you could just run this straight away but uh, you can imagine um, something like this where they would disallow the word import what would you do then uh, and there are like really tricky variants of this and you can do this in uh, like a lot of different contexts uh, like all interpreted languages and other contexts as well so uh, this type of challenges this is what we would call a, a python jail uh, that's like the category of challenge if you want to read up more on them. Um, okay, so let's move on. We close this down. The next challenge is called Hello World. So just gonna update the status and download the challenge and we also give so we're given a, a file an IP address and port so um, we will be writing some code so uh, let's save this here for now uh, so this file that we're given um, what is it it's an elf uh, file, elf, an elf binary, 64-bit executable. So some kind of program. Uh, so we need to uh, look at what this uh, program does. And well, I think let's try to use binary ninja for that, for example. And open up the challenge which is here. Um, we have the disassembly here. Let me see if I can increase the text size. Yes. Uh, so the question in the chat uh, came in a little bit late. What will you do after Pwn? Yeah, I think we will just go through it like Pwn Crypto Forensics if there aren't any strong objections. So um, yes, the binary. We have it here. Uh, we can see there's a main function here, which we can look at. And this is the whole main function. It's a pretty small function. So what does it do? Uh, some calls here to set vbuff. That's about uh, buffering and stuff. It's just to make the program not be a, a pain to solve. Then um, <clears throat> here it calls the put s function with this hello. And then it calls get s. That's interesting. Um, and uh, then it does a string compare against world and it either just exits or prints hello world. 
There's a question here if they understood assembly correctly, uh, all, all machine code can be translated directly to assembly. Is that great? Uh, yes, pretty much. I mean, uh, assembly is pretty much, but not exactly like a one to one relationship with the actual machine code. Uh, there are some, typically in assembler, you have some, um, some macros. Maybe there's like, one assembler instruction that will be translated into like two machine code uh, operations and uh, there's like a little bit of processing and um, small things but essentially yes uh, there's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping to the actual machine code and that means that going either direction like writing a disassembler uh, for a given architecture is typically pretty simple at least a very basic one. Of course, if you want more advanced analysis functions, that's of course extremely complicated, which is why I use a commercial tool like this, like Binary Ninja or so. Um, but that's actually uh, a good point because there's a lot of reversing challenges where you are given like a virtual machine with a custom set and you're basically uh, forced to write your own disassembler for this uh, made up uh, architecture uh, or language. Um, so, okay, this is an extremely simple binary, uh, and it takes input from us, but it doesn't really seem to do anything with the input, except it does compare here against this string world. So let's first run the binary. So we make it executable, as we talked about last time, we run it, and um, it says hello, we say world, it says hello world. Okay. So what's the issue here? The issue is that this function get s is extremely dangerous. Let's see if that's even the documentation. So get s get string, and it will read characters from the standard input and store them uh, as a c, a c string into the uh, string argument until a new line character or end of file is reached. So this means that the function does not take into account at all the allocated uh, memory that we provide to it. So if you just provided more input, it will just blindly write that input and overwrite uh, things in memory. And I'm not going to go through all of the details on how that works and why it happens, but I have a recorded lecture. So if you go to uh, youtube.com slash c2, my uh, channel, and you check uh, among the videos, there is here a uh, lecture on the bi basics of binary exploitation. And in this lecture, I go through all of the details on uh, exactly what happens and uh, you know, how we exploit this and so on. So I will just do like the very quick short version uh, for now. And if you want to learn more, uh, which you do, then like check out that lecture. And basically the idea is we can actually try to run this in, with a debugger. And we disassemble um, the main function and Let's put a breakpoint here just before the return, uh, the main function returns. So we put the breakpoint. Let's see if we can increase the text size a little bit more. We run the program. It says hello. Uh, first of all, uh, let's try something else. We just write like ASD. And then the program exits and it didn't hit our breakpoint. And why is that? That is because this string comparison function, it, we have two branches here the uh, branch where we do com compare uh, equal against world and it goes here and it will print hello world and it will uh, call this puts and then the return instruction. Or if it doesn't, it will call the exit function. And what the exit function does is it just, it kills the program without ever returning. So we will never actually hit this uh, breakpoint that we put here at the return instruction. Uh, there's a question, would you say that Pwn debug is better than GEF? Yes, so uh, I would not, I mean, this, um, I'm using GDB with this add-on called Pwn debug, uh, which is what gives all these like nice coloring and a lot of extra features and stuff. There's another popular 
this is available uh, on uh, GitHub. Um, it's super simple to like download and install. There is the other popular one, which is called Jeff, and it's slightly more lightweight. It doesn't have as many features, but um, I think maybe they will focus on the more important stuff. I've heard it's better if you're doing more complicated setups like remote debugging with GDB and so on. Um, I think you can use either one. I've just used Pwn Debug because I knew about it before I knew about Jeff and I haven't really bothered to learn the other. So, But I, I, you should use one of the two. Uh, it, it makes GDB so much better. Anyway, um, the... exit function just kills the program and we don't get to this return instruction and we want to get here uh, I will explain that so let's try it again and run it and make sure we type the correct thing so that we hit this breakpoint so now we can see here that we are just about to execute this return instruction and this will uh, pop the so this is the stack and this is the addresses here uh, the okay i think i'm back can someone please confirm and uh, Okay, seems good. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, my internet seems to be working fine. Um, could be YouTube. Uh, could be that I just upgraded to the new release of uh, OBS. Um, well, let me know if it happens again. And, you know, worst case, we'll just have to postpone this to uh, another day. But anyway, where did it break? Uh, what was the last thing I talked about? Um, I was looking here in the debugger uh, at the stack, right? Uh, so I was saying that we want to look at what the memory looks like when this thing returns. So we put the breakpoint at the... Uh, we, we look at the disassembly here. We find the address of this return instruction and we put the breakpoint at that position and we run the program typing in world to make sure that we, we hit the breakpoint and th we then look at the stack so uh, sorry the other way around 64 bytes uh, or maybe it's 64 elements at offset minus uh, 32 so this is the current top of the stack so this return instruction that we are about to execute it will pop this top element from the stack and put it in the instruction pointer. So jump to, it will jump to this address. We can see that a little bit, um, like at the slightly lower address, you see that this address ends with AA8. And then here at A98, we have our input world. So this means that if we would have given it just a longer input, it would have just continued writing here uh, and it would it would overwrite this um, address here, so we could control which address it jumps to. Now, where do we want it to jump? It just happens that inside of this binary there is a function called win, and what this function will do is that it will open this flag.txt and it will read it and it will print it to the screen. So that seems like a very good place to go to. But first, let's make just make sure that we can control the contents of this uh, return address. Um, so I will be using some Python code to automate this. I'm using a library called uh, Pwn Tools, also available on GitHub. Uh, you can download and install. It's a very nice. Uh, framework for interacting with um, 
when you're writing exploit and interacting with programs and remote servers and so on. So we, what we want to do is that we want to connect to this remote server and exploit it. But before we do that, we want to make sure that we have an exploit that works locally. So we're going to just run the program locally. So this you would use this process function and then uh, we can just drop directly into an interactive shell just as an example. So let's try that. Okay, so now it just starts the program and we can write world and it writes hello world. Uh, someone is asking if pwn tools is Python 3 ready uh, slash complete yet. Uh, yeah, someone answered it's not 100%. But I would say that I've been, I've been using Pwn tools with Python 3 for over a year and I've encountered very few bugs uh, and uh, you can easily help out fixing them as well because most of the bugs are very trivial uh, to fix. It's usually just that someone forgot to replace like a string with a byte sequence or, or something like that. Um, so yeah it's it, i've been using it with python 3 for for over a year no major issues at all um so uh, this is uh, but i mean this is kind of pointless we're just starting the program and interacting with it so we want to automate this so what we can do now is we can to really i mean in this specific case, the program is so simple, we could do this with less uh, detail, but I just want to show uh, how this could work. So first we want to like wait until the program has printed out this string hello. So we can use these different receive functions in Pwn Tools to say like, okay, we want to receive until we receive a whole line that contains the string hello. And then when that has happened we want to send the line world and then we switch over to an interactive shell so let's try to run that and now it does the the thing for us and it will just it just prints out hello world okay so now if we then instead of world send a much longer thing we could just say send like 200 a's um that should then overwrite this return address and, and, and crash the program. And said that the program exited with code zero. That means that it's exited uh, just fine. So why uh, was this? Yes, that's because of this thing that we talked about here, that if it doesn't compare true against uh, world, it will go to this branch and just call exit. So we must make sure that this function call uh, returns true. Now, how do we do that? Um, so string compare assumes that the inputs are C strings. That means that it's a sequence of uh, bytes terminated by a null byte. So if we, I mean, if we would just send like world followed by a sequence of A's, this would not, this would not work because, um, it does the comparison like yes it starts with world but then there's more stuff however if we add a null byte here uh, it will uh, work because remember that the get string function it will read until a new line character or end of file is reached and a null byte is not a new line character so it will read world it will read the null byte and it will continue to read all the stuff uh, afterwards. However, the string compare function will only read up until the null byte. So it will stop comparing here and it will say, yes, these two strings are equal and then it will continue running. So if we run this now instead, uh, we can see that the program exited with code minus 11, uh, seg fault. Um, so the program crashed. Now, how can we like inspect what's going on here. How can we debug this while this is happening? So what we can do is that after we started this, we put in a pause here in our exploit script. So before we send anything, we just pause the execution of our exploit script. And what we can do then is we can attach to this with a debugger. So you see here that the Python script has started this local process, hello world. 
uh, with the uh, process ID of uh, 8559. And with GDB, when you start it, so far I've been started GDB by providing it a binary that we can start from inside GDB. But you can also attach to an existing process by giving a process ID number. Now we could provide this like manual, just type in 8559. Uh, that would work absolutely fine. Let's do this. Okay, so now we, have, now we have attached to this process. However, that's a little bit annoying because then every time we launch the script, we have to like copy paste this number or whatever. So there is like a, a, a nice way that you can do this is by using a subshell. So first of all, there's a program called PID off. So you can run this program PID off hello world and it will return, it will print out the process ID of the um, first program it finds that has this name. And if we then put this into a subshell, we can use this as an argument to GDB. So here it will first run this PID of hello world and replace this string here with that output and then run this outer command. So if we do this, we also attach to the process. Okay, so now um, let's again look here at the main function and set the breakpoint at the end where it's about to return. And we let go of the control. We continue or just C for short. So now the program is free to continue running. And then here over in the export script, we just press any key to let the, uh, the script continue running. So it will send this data. And we send something. And then if we look back here now, we hit the, this breakpoint. And now the stack is suddenly filled with a lot of these uh, hexadecimal 41s, which is the capital A. So now we see that the return instruction would pop this 41, 41, 41 number into uh, the instruction pointer. And if we just step one instruction forward, well, the program crashes. Um, so it seems that we are now able to take control of the program uh, by overwriting this return address. So small issue though is how can we in a convenient way find exactly where we should start writing, like where should we put the address? Like is it after four A's, six A's, eight A's? We don't know. We could in this case, like we could count and just, or like look at the address here and look at the address here and then like calculate the offset. Um, so um, yeah, there's a question here. Uh, is the Sturcom function a reference to an external function, not necessarily in the binary or has the disassembler identified it as Sturcom? No. So this program, uh, let's actually look here at the lower world. You can see that it's a dynamically linked uh, program. That means that libraries such as the C standard library is not baked into the binary itself. It's referenced uh, externally. So if we look at this uh, inside binary ninja, for example, you can see that, okay, it's a little bit, it's a bit small text, but you can see that some of the functions here, they have this uh, lighter colored text. Um, they are functions with code actually inside the binary. These yellow functions, they are imported functions that uh, are referenced uh, from an, uh, to another, there are references to another library. So what will happen is that if we look at, for example, some of these functions, let's say, let's say we look at the stereocom function. This is what it looks like inside the binary. It just uh, takes this uh, location, this uh, entry in this table, uh, and dereferences that to get an address and jumps to that location. So somewhere else in the binary, we have this table, the, uh, the GOT, the global offset table. And this is a table of addresses of these other functions. And this is just like a placeholder. And when the program starts, the operating system will like look at all the different libraries the program is referencing. Like, okay, it needs the C standard library. So it will uh, look at all the functions it needs. It will load the C library into memory, take all those addresses of those uh, functions and like 
copy them into this table so that when the program is running, it will uh, call this like dummy function, this stub, which will just look in this table and then jump to the actual function. Uh, the uh, other uh, alternative is a statically compiled uh, binary where you would just take all the libraries that you need and just bake them together into one big uh, binary. And in that case, uh, the, the names are no longer important, so they might be stripped away. Um, and then there are other techniques to try to kind of like identify them, like some, some pattern matching stuff, and, uh, but that's, it's more complicated. Now you just, just, you just get the names straight up. Anyway, to be able to know where in this we, uh, we want the address, we can use a very nifty function called cyclic. So first of all, let's uh, restructure the code a little bit, not just put everything in one line. So we put our, we create this payload variable, uh, it's an empty variable, and then we add this world uh, part, which is the like trigger to get to the right branch. And then we have this cyclic function and let's do 128 characters. And also we should set it to because we are using 64-bit, we want 8-byte um, elements. So what this function will do, you can actually run it in a, in a terminal. Um, it will generate a sequence of characters. Uh, I think it's called a, a De Bruyne sequence. Sorry for the pronunciation. And basically you can see that it's like a B, A, C, A, D, and so on. And this way we can, by having eight of these characters, we can like uniquely identify the offset inside the string where it is located. And what that means is that if we send this uh, payload, so let's kill that script, run it again, uh, attach GDB, set a breakpoint, continue, run it, you see here that this is about to return to this address. Uh, so now we can take this uh, value, this hex 61, 63, and so on, uh, back into Pwn Tools and use another function called cyclic find. So, And it will give us the offset. So it says that this element is located 10 bytes from the start of the um, of this sequence. So that means that we can just replace this then by that many bytes of padding. And then finally, we can do, let's put eight Bs here. So now if we've done this correctly, the return address should be exactly these eight Bs, which are hex 42, 42, 42, and so on. So let's try that again. Run the exploit script, run GDB, set the breakpoint, continue, let it run. Uh, make sure you don't mix bytes and strings, redo it. Breakpoint, continue, run. And yes, you see that this is uh, exactly this address. Now, how do we get the address of the win function and how do we put that into um, this uh, into our exploit code? Because we have a number here and we're inputting a string here. So here you have to remember that um, the addresses are, or the numbers are encoded in little endian. That means that this least significant byte is actually first in the sequence of bytes. So you have to kind of like reverse the order of the bytes for an address. Uh, however, luckily there is like a helper function for this in, in Pontus, so it's called P64, so PAC64. So we could just, uh, as an example, let's put in like a dummy address here. Um, so this is a 64-bit uh, address. And if I done this correctly, uh, it should show up exactly like this the debugger so let's run it again 
attach debugger, breakpoint, continue. And yes, it does. So now the final little step is just how of this win function. We could do it from, for example, binary ninja. We could just um, copy the address. Okay, I think we are back. And could someone just uh, tell me what was the last thing I was talking about um, overwriting the address and uh, we tried this dummy address, uh, which did work. And so we using this uh, pack 64 function. So um, now how, you, how do you find the, the real uh, address of this win function? Uh, you go into, for example, binary ninja and uh, like copy the address of it, or you can use a tool such as nm and grep for the win function and find the address. And now the reason this works is that uh, if you use a tool called uh, checksec to look at what protection this have, you can see that this uh, does not have pi. So pi stands for position independent executable. So since that's not activated, the program will be loaded in the same location in memory every time. Um, so we we know that the, the address will stay uh, consistent. So let's just put that address here. So now our full payload is first world followed by a null byte, then some padding, namely this value that's returned from the cyclic find thing that we got by using this cyclic method. This is will be 10 of these and then the address packed as a 64-bit integer. So now if we run this, no, uh, run this script, we set the breakpoint, let it continue, run the exploit script, and then you see that here, right at the return, it says it's about to return to the win function. And we can let it continue, uh, and it fails because there is no um, flag.txt. We could easily create one, we we'll just say echo, fake flag, put it into flag.txt. Uh, we try to run it again, and you see that it prints the fake flag. So that's good. Let's run this against the remote uh, server. And now what's really nice is that since we built this nice um, exploit using this uh, pwn tools thing, uh, this uh, the tubes uh, module, we can just replace this process here by a remote connection. So just make this one line change. And instead of starting a local program and running it against that, we will just connect to the server and do the exact same thing. So let's close that down. And we run this against the remote server. And you can see here that it prints the flag. Now, uh, this is a little bit related to uh, that the interactive module in uh, Pwn tools hasn't really been properly ported to uh, Python three. So if there are any like non-printable characters in the uh, in the buffer when you call interactive, it will error out. So, uh, but that's yeah. You can usually just uh, get around that by making sure to receive uh, the appropriate amount. Anyway, that's not really an issue right now. So we get this uh, result back and we get the flag. So we close this down. And so there's a question here, if the if it had a pi, uh, if pi would have been enabled, would the offset you'd find with the cyclic function still be constant? Yes, so with pi, I mean, the, the offset is related to how things are allocated on the stack. And that's related to what the code does, not where the code is located. Um, so the stack itself will be randomized every time it starts. So the absolute addresses of the stack will be different, but the relative distance between elements on the stack will be the same if it executes in the same way. And in the same way, the absolute address of each function in the code will be random but they will all be allocated as one 
block. So the relative distance between functions will still be the same. That means that if you knew, if you managed to like leak the address of one function, you can calculate the address of all the other functions. Um, so that's that. Let's move on to the next one, echo service. I'm just going to update the status. Uh, okay. Echo service. Since the Hello World program was so good, I decided to build an echo service. Nothing can go wrong, right? Again, we're given an IP address and a port uh, and a file. So let's create a new directory. This is also a 64 bit um, elf binary. We create a Python script that will be that we will use for um, exploiting this, and we get this IP and port into the script. And then we open the program again with um, binary ninja. We go to the main function and this is what it does. It just prints something and then it uses the get as a uh, function again. And then it will just print that and then it will return. So we can just, um, overwrite the um, return address as as in the last one. So let's check what protections this has. Um, so again, no pi, so we know where the code will be located. And again, there is a win function. Let's look at this. But now the win function is a little bit more complicated. So here, uh, the uh, author unfortunately made a mistake. So I'm going to solve it the way this is intended and not the way you could solve it. So the idea here is that at the beginning of this win function, it will check the value of these global variables, x, y, z. It will check that they have the value like, like x is three, y is five and z is five. Otherwise it will abort. And if all of those things are, are correct, it will uh, print you win and run the uh, cat flag. Now there is nothing stopping us. I mean, we don't have to jump to the beginning of a function. We don't have to jump to here. We might as well jump here. So first of all, let's do that. Let's, let's do that solution. So again, we, first of all, let's make the program runnable. Let's try it. It just prints back what we want. Uh, so we have a, uh, payload and we just want to find the offset to the return address. So we do this cyclic thing, like 128 of them should be enough. Um, and then we send this to the program. And uh, let's put in a pause here. Um, so run this and then again, attach the debugger, set a breakpoint at the end of the main function. Let go of the control, run the script, see that this is it's about to return to this address. So we pad out with um, that many A's and then we, we can just put in like a test address just to make sure that it's, that it works. We run it again, script, attach debugger, set breakpoint, continue, run, and we see that it will return to this. So uh, let's find this address in the middle of the function here. Uh, so we want to jump into this instruction where it 
loads this command cat flag.txt and then runs the system. So we copy the address of this location and uh, let's create a fake flag. Um, so we have a flag.txt. Okay, cool. And now we run this. We just attach the debugger again, set the breakpoint, let it run. And then we see that it here it will jump into this location. And here we are in the middle of the win function where it will load this um, value into this. The, the, it will load a pointer to the string into this register. So we can step over here and then we check the RDI register. It has this value, which is pointing to this string cat flag. And then it will call the system and the RDI register, is the, it contains the first argument. So running this, it will print out the flag. So in a way that's even easier than the previous uh, challenge. Now, this was not the idea of this challenge. This is unfortunately an unintended solution. So the idea of this is that we actually want to set these variables. And how do we do that? Um, where are these variables referenced? They are referenced in these function. Like if we look at X, it's referenced in this function called part one. And in the same way, in part two, we see there's a variable called Y. And in part three, there's a variable called um, Z. So, Um, the idea here is that this is like an introduction to return oriented programming. Um, and all of these functions, they do a bunch of different things. Let's look at the first one. The first one is simple. It will just actually, it will just set uh, the X variable to three and then it's done. So, What we can do here is, how do I explain this in a very simple way? Whenever this return instruction is executed, it will pop another, it will pop an address from the stack and, and jump to that address. And then if there are more addresses on the stack, like next time it will hit the return uh, instruction, it will pop another address, so jump to that location. and go to another return instruction and pop another address and jump to that location. So you can set up like a chain of things where like a, a chain of places in the code where it should jump to. Each, each such small piece of code needs to end with the return instructions, like trigger the jump to the next one. Uh, such a block, like a sequence of instructions uh, terminated by a return instruction is called a gadget. It's like a small piece of code that does something. You can put these addresses, addresses to all of these um, gadgets in a chain, uh, and uh, this is this is called return-oriented programming because it's like the return instruction that kind of drives this mechanism forward, and uh, so that's shortened ROP, and this uh, sequence of addresses that you um, inject is called a ROP chain. So basically, we want to create a ROP chain that will like call this part one function and do something and then it will call the part two function and then the part three function and then the win function so uh for the first one it's simple so first first of all we're gonna get the addresses of all of these uh functions so let's just write them down uh so that we can reference them in our script and the win function as well. So we just uh, part two. Oh, sorry, that didn't copy properly. And then part part three. And then the win function. Okay, so now, no, wait. So there is something about like my, 
I don't know, desktop environment or something. It doesn't, it's something the UI, it doesn't really, sometimes it doesn't copy to the clipboard. I don't know what, why that happens. Someone mentioned a third way in the comments of like using the gets function to like write data into these global variables. That would also work, but that's an exercise for the listener. Um, so basically, so this is one way of solving it. So what we can do now is just let's put this address of this part one as a payload. And then I will just to illustrate something, I will put one, two, and three as 364 bit uh, integers afterwards. So what happens if we run this? Let's run our script, attach our debugger, set the breakpoint, continue, let the payload run. So here it will, when it's returning from the main function, it will pop the first address from the top of the stack, the address to part one. And you can see here, the rest of the stack afterwards is this zero, one, and two that I've uh, put in there in our payload here. So rem remember that. So we jump into this function and now it, throughout the execution of this function, it will first push a value to the stack and then it will pop a value to the stack, but then it will return to the next item here on the stack. Now this is zero, so this will just crash. So now we can put the address of part two here, probably. Um, but let's check. So the part one is simple because it will just simply pr put the right value in the y, uh, sorry, in the x variable. So what does part two actually do? So part two will look at the um, RDI register or EDI here, it's a 32 bit, and it compare it to the value uh, hex 1337. And if it's uh, correct, then uh, it will do this assignment. So we need to make sure that the RDI register is set to this value, which if we look here, when this was happening, it's not, it's set to one. So we need to make, make it so. So how can we do that? Well, we could make it, um, if we don't jump directly from part one to part two, but instead we jump to a small thing that would uh, maybe pop this value from the stack and then do a return. So if we have a sequence of instruction, which is like a pop RDI and then a return, and then we put the value on the stack and that would work. So how do we do this? We can use a tool called ROP gadget. It's also available on GitHub, uh, this one. Or there's another good good tool called RP++. Um, and there are a few others as well uh, that you can use to find uh, these gadgets. So you give it a binary and then we grep for like pop RDI. And here it gives us that at this address here, you have a pop RDI followed by a ret. So we can take this address. Uh, it's a question if this CTF is still running. No, it's not. It ended Sunday evening. I would not live stream uh, the CTF it was, if it was still running. That would be uh, cheating. So let's put... First of all, let's replace, replace that with a variable. And now we put the address uh, to the part one um, function. Then we have the address to this gadget that does the pop RDI and return. So it will pop this value from the stack into the RDI register, and then it will return here. So make sure that what that works. Um, Start the program, attach the debugger, set the breakpoint, let it continue, run the script, see that it jumps to part one, step through this, and then at the end of the um, uh, of this function, you see that it will jump from this part one function into this uh, pop RDI thing. And if you look at the top of the stack now, our 1337 value is here. 
So we can just step again. And now we see that the RDI register here does have the correct value. So, and then it will uh, attempt to return to this address too. So now we should be able to uh, put the address of the part two function there and the requirements will be uh, fulfilled. So it should assign five to this Y. Let's check number three. Here it will, uh, what will it do? It will copy the RDI register into this location, compare it to 1337. And then it will use com copy the RSI register or ESI register to this location and compare it to 1338. So this time we need to set both the RDI and the RSI register. So let's do use drop gadget and just grep for pop RSI. And here we find a gadget that does pop RSI, pop R15 and ret. And I mean, we don't want to uh, affect the R15 register, but actually we don't really care. So we can modify the R15 uh, register. We, we just make sure it, it can have any value. Just It just needs to be something. So let's take this address, address gadget pop RSI R15. And we can go to this gadget. Um, so after we run the part two thing, we jump to this gadget and this gadget will pop two, two values from the stack. So we need to put two values here. And then finally, we should be able to um, jump to the win function. Uh, so it will first pop the RSI uh, register. So this is the value here, and that, the, that is the one we care about. So let's set that one to 1338, and then it will pop the R15 value, and we don't care. So just let's put a zero there. Uh, so now this is our ROP chain. Again, we run the script, we attach the debugger, we set the breakpoint, we let it continue, we run the script. You see that it will first jump to the part one, we step through that. It will jump to the first gadget that will pop 1337 uh, of the stack and then we'll pop jump into the part two uh, function and it will see here it will do this assignment of five to this variable and then here at the end it will jump into this other gadget that we had which will pop rsi into um it will pop uh, the top of the element of the stack into the rsi register and then we pop this zero into the r15 register so you can see here now that uh, the RDI register is still unmodified. So it's still 1337. RSI is set to 1338 and the R15 is set to zero, but we don't care. And then it will go into the win function and this will then pass all the checks. And or so I thought maybe I was a little bit too quick. Let's Let's look at that again. We step through all of this, part two, gadget, uh, win function. So first it will load this first variable, three, do the comparison, it's fine. And then it will load the second variable, five, compare it, good, and then Actually, what does the win function? Uh, it just cats the flag, right? Yeah. Um, so, and then, oh. This didn't work. Did I flip the order of the, in the part three one? So the part three was not done correctly. So let's go through that one uh, more carefully again. Breakpoint, continue, run, step, go to part two. So the uh, RDI register compares
Oh, I never put the part three function uh, in here. It goes directly from. It. Sorry, that's uh, that was the mistake. We forgot that we actually need to go to the part three where it actually does the comparison. So run again. Debugger, continue. Step through all of this. And now it comes to part three where it does the comparison and it does the assignment and then it jumps into the win function where all of the comparisons are okay. And it says you win, but uh, yeah, it didn't cat the flag. It did print. Uh, is it supposed to be called? So, is this this? Um, Uh, sorry, I need to just check this again. Then why didn't this work? So we step through all the way to the to the win function. Here we load this string, call uh, the puts function, and here we run this cat flag. And oh, okay, this is oh, okay, this is a bit. Uh, how should I explain this? Um, first of all, I'm just gonna double check one thing. Uh, to make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Yes, okay. So this is a, one, a tricky one that can easily bite you. Uh, so inside of this, um, you see do system. We have a crash here at this move XMM word thing. And these instructions, uh, they, move like larger chunks of data uh, but they need the addresses to be aligned to 16 byte uh, boundaries so in this case it's trying to operate on the rsp plus 60 and rsp is not um, properly aligned to a 16 byte uh, boundary or maybe now this time it was no sorry this was from the crash yes so it's not so how do we make sure that it is well we can just insert another just a single return instruction again that will take up eight bytes and then just pop another element from the stack so what i did here was that i took the address of uh, this pop rdi thing and I just happen to know that those instructions are one byte long, so I just added one to get a single ret. But if you want to be more thorough, you can of course just do like drop gadget and uh, grep on ret and just take, for example, this one and do address gadget ret and then put this in here. So now if we try this again, and set the breakpoint, continue, run this, all the way down to the wind function. Um, now you see that the stack pointer is aligned to a 16 byte uh, boundary. So when we run it, it works <clears throat> and it will uh, print the fake flag. So that's a very, uh, interesting little detail that can easily confuse you a lot. So now that we have a working exploit locally, 
just run let's just run it against the remote server and here it prints the uh, flag and then some error messages because it crashes so that's the flag so question if we're playing angstrom or uh, confidence on last weekend we still playing the angstrom ctf ah uh, we wanted something a little bit simpler and uh, we're doing pretty fine i think we have a few challenges left uh, does it end today yeah i think it ends tonight so we'll let's see if we manage to get everything um done maybe maybe not okay that was the echo service now for the last pawnable um notebook so Um, let's make a new challenge. Same thing here, binary, IP address and port. We start with the same skeleton thing. And uh, let's get this binary in here. Note. Let's close down this one in echo. Um, let's uh, switch things around. Let's open this. Oh, first, of course, we need to check what this is. Note, it's a 64 bit uh, elf binary. Let's open it in. Um, Ida, I mean you can use uh, Gidra as well to get to get the decompiler. Um, I should I think this should be simple enough to. I mean any any tool would uh, work. And notebook. So. Uh, let me just increase the font size a little bit. Is this readable or do you want even larger? So here we have a classic challenge with like a menu. So it will print like a menu. It will read your um, menu choice. And then depending on what you did, it will... Um, do one of these actions like delete notepad, delete note, edit note, list notepads, add note, uh, view note, add notepad. So typically what we're looking for here is some kind of probably like a use after free or some something where we can get like a pointer to point to the wrong thing and corrupt memory somehow. So let's, uh, first of all, let's, uh, let's run the program. So we run this, we can do like, let's add a notepad in slot zero, call it N1. And then we can like view or maybe list notes we can add a note in notepad zero and add it in note slot zero with text hello and date today and then maybe we can do list notes again um, and then view note notepad zero note zero text hello date today and what can we do more edit note in notepad zero text world date tomorrow view note okay the date disappeared maybe i already accidentally triggered some kind of bug anyway delete note from some notepad what happens if we try to view that nothing what what happens if we try to view
okay so yeah so that's we get a general feel for um what's going on what happens if we delete like a whole notepad notepad zero and then uh no we already deleted the note anyway let's look at the code more what's going on here so let's look at the add notepad here it will ask for a slot and and it will yeah we cannot use uh, a slot that's uh, too hard let's change the return value of there uh so here we'll allocate okay there's a global variable called books so why is this oh it thinks this is an array it's not it's just a single um so yeah it somehow thinks this is an array but whatever for now uh, or maybe we could do unsigned bin 64 just okay that looks, that looks better uh so it will use this to index into this global variable called books and then we will read uh, so this global variable books it has eight uh, slots that's correct it will allocate a 72 byte uh, chunk of memory it will read a name into the uh, so 72 is 64 plus 8 so i guess it's like 64 bytes for the text or maybe it's 64 bytes for all the entries yes that, that would make sense and then it's eight bytes for the name so the name is stored at the end and then you have 64 bytes uh maybe used for referencing the actual notes okay uh let's look then at the add note it will uh, it will ask for this index notepad and then which note are we actually indexing and and yes so this will then as i said the first 64 bytes of the notepad is an array of um uh, of uh, pointers eight pointers eight times eight 64 and they themselves are 72 uh, byte element this is something to keep in mind that the the notepads and the notes are of equal size, which means that they are allocated in the same um, bucket of uh, uh, chunks. So that there, that's good because we can do some confusion there. And what does it do? So it uses the first 64 bytes for text and then the last eight bytes for the date. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So what happens then when we edit the note? Uh, again, it will ask for like the notepad index and then for the note index. And then we'll take that and it will just update the contents of it so doesn't seem to be anything specific with that let's actually create a structure for notepad and note so a note is first 64 bytes of text and then eight bytes of date and a notepad is um, an array of uh, pointers to notes followed by 
an eight byte name. And then this books thing is an array of pointers to notepads. So that should make things more readable. And uh, so the edit function does, it just seems to edit stuff. So that should be fine. Uh, list notepads, it will just go through all of them and print their name. Okay, no problem with that. The add note, we already looked at that. Edit note, uh, view note. And this will then uh, take a a note and it will print the contents uh, of this. And then we print the text and the, okay. So what does this delete note? does it do it will get the notepad index he will get the notepad it will get the note index and it will just call free on this and here we have a bug so this will free the memory uh, associated with this note but it will not clear out the pointer. So for example, um, if we delete the note and then go into view note, uh, let's check, let's say we create a notepad at index zero, we create a note at index zero, we delete that, we go into view note, we, we select notepad index zero and then note index zero and then it will just use this memory and print out uh, whatever is, is there. So the memory has been freed, but unless it's like allocated or something is done with it, it's still there, but it can also be allocated again if you call malloc uh, again. So we could have two things in the program pointing, have, having pointers pointing at the same piece of memory, but both of them believing that's that it's theirs. So that's interesting. And then let's look at the delete notepad. Uh, same thing here. It will call free on a on one notepad notepad, but it won't um, uh, like free the it will, will not kind of like reset the memory or somehow indicate that this memory should not be used. So this means that we could, for example, if we would create a notepad, create a note and then delete that note and then like create a new notepad, it's very likely that, and this depends on which version of, of libc and so on, but you, you have to try exactly in which order things are done. But basically you could have a notepad pointing, uh, notepad having a note but that note is also another notepad so they're pointing to the same place now what does this mean it means that um, let's say that we have i mean a notepad if we look at these things uh look at these notes and notepads you could basically like depending on which way you access them uh you could treat them as um one or the other you like overlay this diff these two different views of it so that means that if we like create a notepad and a note delete that note and create a new notepad then the zero note of the zero notepad would also be the same memory as notepad number one so if we then edit the text of that note we are at the same time modifying what will be interpreted as the um, 
pointers to all the notes in notepad number one. And that means we can get a setup where we can write stuff wherever we want. Uh, so why is that? How, how could we do that then? So we would create this setup that I, uh, uh, that I just, that just described, and then we would edit note zero in notepad zero, and we would use, make it so that the first eight uh, bytes, for example, of this is a pointer to somewhere else in memory. That's that, somewhere we want to write data to. And then we go in and edit um, notepad number one, note number zero. And that will dereference this uh, pointer, sorry, this pointer, uh, and then it will write to that memory location. So that means we can write whatever we want, wherever we want, up to 64 bits, uh, 64 bytes at a time, or even actually up to 72 uh, bytes at a time. So let's let's first uh, create this setup, and then I'll explain what we can do with this. So here we we want to automate all of this interaction. So we will uh, first it will print the menu. So we will uh, wait until it has uh, printed the menu. And then uh, we want to, uh, what did I say? We want to add a notepad. And what happens then? It will ask for a slot. And we will just go for slot number zero. And then the name uh, doesn't matter because this is not the one we're going to exploit. So just, uh, I mean, put my name. And then we are, oh wait, it will just read eight bytes. And this is, okay, this is fine. Um, then we're back in the menu. So we wait for it. So this is like, whoa, create notepad zero. And then uh, we create this uh, note by, so what menu item was that? Add note is S. So add note, which notepad notepad zero and then which note and again slot zero and it will ask for text and this it doesn't really matter because we are going to free this again immediately so we can just put an empty string for text and empty string for date so now we've created notepad 0 and note 0, 0 and now we will delete this note delete is d And it will delete note, ask for notepad, note, and it will delete it. And now we will create another notepad in slot one. And the idea now is that
if this has been set up correctly, we should now be able to edit note 0, 0.0, and that would actually edit the notes pointers of notepad 1. I wish I could like draw a diagram or something, but I really hope like if you if you want me to explain this in more detail than memory layout, uh, please let me know in the chat. But I, I think it should be clear enough. Um, what did I say? Edit note. So if you want to edit note. 0, 0.0 which is also notepad 1 because they sh it's they they are uh, sharing the same uh, memory location and uh, what's the man, e for edit 0 and 0 and now we sh we want to and then it asks for the text and date so we'll just go up here again uh, and here now, let's put here uh, this like cyclic uh, 64 thing, and then date, uh, we don't care. So now, the, um, if this worked correctly, we should have overwritten the uh, notes table of notepad1 with this cyclic64 thing. And that means that if we try to view, for example, note 1.0, then it should crash. So we tr we let's try to do this. View note uh, 1.0 and the menu item for viewing a note is V. So this, if we are lucky, uh, and there's nothing strange with the memory allocator, should uh, it should crash. So first of all, let's just try it. And no. OK, so no, sorry, I might have I must have forgotten to. Yes, sorry, notepad one note zero and now it crashed okay so what happens let's look in a debugger what's going on we start up the script it's paused we attach with the debugger and let it continue and run this and it tries to here it tries to read from this address rdi which is this um uh, address so yeah we got a crash wait I need to do this because we're doing 64-bit um, so let me just run that to get the proper offset it's trying to read from this address yeah okay it's still the same um, so it's inside this sterland function so specifically in the code if you look at the view note it's uh, if you look here in in the call stack you can see it's inside the uh, printf inside the printf function that uh, this goes wrong so it's probably here when it tries to uh, write the data okay so how can we uh, use this? We can, this uh, global offset table that I talked about before. And what we can do is that we can, you can we see here that the system function is uh, present in the, in the program. So we could overwrite this table. First of all, let's look at the actions of the, of the program. Use uh, check sec note. And you see that it says here this is partial rel row. So if it says partial rel row or no rel row, that means that we can overwrite this 
table of functions. So we could, could for example, overwrite a, the put s function with the system function. And that would mean that any call to put s would actually be a call to system. Now, if we combine that with some function where we control what's being uh, passed as an argument, then that would be enough. So is there any place where, uh, I mean, free is a good option. We could uh, control, uh, no, maybe not. So, let's see if there's some, some simple choice here. Um, so um, what we're looking for something to some easy way to just get like replace with there's a suggestion to overwrite this bye bye message i would assume that this is wait is this in writable no oh Yeah, this is in writable memory. Yeah, then we should just uh, Yeah, then we should just overwrite that. Yes, of course. So here they run this uh, they run system with this string argument and I actually uh, I just assumed that this was a static uh, like a constant, but this is actually in uh, writable memory. So we can just overwrite this message here with um, whatever we want. So that means that this is the address. And again, no pi. So this address will always be the same. So let's put this as a constant here. Address um, system argument. So let's, instead of cyclic here, do this address and we can just fill it up just put this eight times in this table and actually now if we just run this um, still viewing the note it should then uh, print this uh, message yes look you see here uh, text echo so what has happened here is now that the uh, note zero of notepad one is now pointing to this message in memory. Actually, all of the uh, uh, all of the notes in notepad one are pointing to this one. So that we could should now be able to just do an edit uh, and just replace this with like uh, a shell. So where's the edit command here? just copy all of this but for notepad one message zero and then for the text we can just put uh, execute bin sh and then uh, we have edited this and then we can view it again actually to make sure that it's still there so Oh, some trouble with the stream or yeah, please, please, please tell me in the chat if there's any uh, issues with the stream. Um, so it should be fine. I think I have no dropped frames so far. 
So you can see that this has been overwritten with this bin sh. So now we just need to trigger this by uh, sending this menu option, which is exit. So final thing, uh, trigger system. And now we should then be able to run this and we have a shell. So um, let's run this against the remote server. Uh, we replace this with remote host in the port. It took a, took a while and yeah, looks like we have solved the challenge. So the key mechanism here, you see there was a lot of like logistics and uh, boilerplate and stuff, but the whole key idea is that when we delete a note, we call free on that pointer, which tells the memory allocator that this memory uh, is now, you know, I'm not gonna use it anymore. You're free to give it away uh, to someone else calling malloc but it won't actually like delete anything or remove any data or whatever it will the memory will still be there so the point and the pointer is pointing to it and then when you do add notepad again it will call malloc and the memory allocator will think like okay you're requesting a 72 byte block of memory look i have here a just you know freshly freed block of 72 bytes of memory so i'll just give it to you so now both the books index one pointer and the uh, index zero of notebook zero pointer are pointing to the exact same memory location. So that's called a use after free, that you continue to use the memory even have, uh, though it has been freed. And with that, we've solved the whole pointable category. Let's move on to Cryptography. And this is called uh, Baby Crypto. Create some notes file. I should update the status. So I love egg and bacon. What is this? We are given a a long string of B's and A's and it's and this is 155 characters. Um, so we note that we only have like two different characters in this like b and a so we can assume that this could be replaced by any um uh, any two characters i mean the the, the 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 that it's specifically b and a is not really significant so actually I just want to see how many did so if we select all the bees you can see that it's um you know we have a bunch of these and it's at most 10 a's in a row and at least zero uh, and someone said like you could I would assume a is one and b is zero 
Uh, yeah, so if that would be the case, let's say that we guess that it starts with um, just something like this, and then say that this is And we are back. I have no idea why the stream keeps dying. Uh, I will have to investigate this um, afterwards. At least the, uh, the the fix is very quick. Uh, so, yeah, shouldn't be shouldn't be a big problem. Um, let's just well put this back. Um, yes, now something struck me. Maybe this is actually a hint. I vaguely recollect a cipher. Egg, bacon, bacon cipher. All oh, right. Okay, so it's like um, um, it's just like an enco an encoding. Um, and okay, so one way you is that you could just Google this and and find this out. But how would you otherwise be able to know this? Um, as I said, the length of this is 155 characters. And that's not divisible by eight. So it's not, we, even if we assume that this is like, you know, just a binary, so one and zero, it's not an 8-bit byte uh, system. We have to split it up in a different way. Uh, and it turns out that it's like a 5-bit um, system. So, yeah, I guess we could just do like bacon cipher decoder. And put this thing in here and get scrambled eggs and bacon are the best. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, just, you know, Google the words in the descri description and uh, find it out. Otherwise, I guess you could, as I said, um, somehow deduce that this should be like if, if it, 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 it the length of the if if we assume that there's like there's like blocks which uh, represent characters, then it then it has to be divisible by the length. I mean, it, it doesn't have to, but it's, it probably is. So, yeah, that's a bit uh, like a little bit lame actually. Uh, but okay, we have a flag. Uh, cool. Uh, so that's called bacon cipher. Crypto number two, hidden message. Uh, what do you mean flag? There's no, no such thing here. I don't know what you're talking about. Stop asking, uh, like cut it off. I'm not hiding anything. Uh, check this file yourself. And So, what's in this file? So it's a text file. What happens if we cat it? It's like, there's nothing here and there are some strange characters. And if you remember from the last episode, uh, when I talked about, when we did the um, SSH thing with the files, we could use XXD to get like a hex encoding. And this does look strange. 
So we have the text here. It says like, there is nothing here. Um, but we have all these other characters. So what do they mean? Um, let's see. I guess th these are like Unicode characters, like uh, guess, and I think it's maybe there is just like so some of these bytes they are in in blocks that repeat, and maybe if there are like only two of them, this is just like a string of bits. Um, so if we open this up in a hex editor. This is my favorite hex editor, 010 editor. Uh, I think it's really great. Um, and uh, open this. And I should just see if I can increase the font size. No, okay, here. Uh, so you can see that if we take these three bytes and we search for them, whoa, not there, and get all occurrences of it, you can see that it's like half the file or something, all these purple ones, and then you have these other ones uh, with the uh, that ends with the 8C, and then you have some actual uh, printable characters left. So what if we do just like a replace, and we just replace these three bytes with, well, let's go with one, and then we replace these other three bytes with a zero. And then we just delete these other characters. You could probably use like a regex search and do this a bit quicker, but whoa, the file is so small i'll just do this by hand and now we have just a stream of bits or bolts apparently oh i should uh should update the status uh, okay so let's open this uh new file actually i want to uh, Open this one, and this is 168 characters long, which is divisible by eight, right? 168, oh, yes, that's 21 bytes. So maybe this is, though we have to consider now that we could have flipped this the wrong way around. It could be that the ones are zeros and the zeros are ones. Uh, so we have to take that in consideration. I think that's actually true because, again, if this is printable ASCII, then the first bit should always be zero, but it turns out that, oh no, it's actually not even consistent. Well, it doesn't have to be just printable ASCII. Uh, so could be, well, let's try both ways and try to decode this uh, to something. And so if we just take this, I guess we could just do like a binary to ASCII converter. Uh, just do some online thing. That does not seem to give us any, no, that's not nice. So let's try it the other way around. Um, so we, Um, 
we replace the ones with two and then we replace the zeros with a one and then the twos with the zero so now we have inverted the the bits ah and this is almost a flag um i guess so this is in swedish i assume that this should be this or let's see it's every other upper and lower case so this is probably the flag then it's just text encoding thing so let's try this ah yes that's the flag so what we did here was that we opened this original file we looked at it uh like at a hex hex dump of the file and we saw that in between these like printable characters there are a lot of like unicode white space characters and there are exactly two different variants of them so re we replace all of one kind with one and all of the other kind with zero and then we try to treat that as just like uh bytes like eight bits uh, represent one character now we chose the wrong one to be zero uh, and one first so we just flipped it uh, and then we decode that and i guess it's actually like latin one encoded or something because this uh non um, ascii character came out wrong uh, but you can see that this is it says hidden messages in swedish so that was easily fixed uh, so that was the second crypto now let's go on to a poorly structured algebra uh, which you can see it says r s a and that here is an rsa encrypted message decrypted challenge.txt um, so let's update this look at this uh, file we see that we get an n an e and a c so, I mean, this is just an RSA encrypted message, and I won't really go into all the details of RSA, but the core idea here is that you have this um, relationship. You have two uh, parameters, E and D, uh, and they are inverses of each other uh, in in this mathematical construct so that um when you raise or well yeah so when you uh you encrypt the message by taking the your message as a number you have to convert it to a number raise it to the power of e modulo this n and then you get this c and then you can decrypt it by taking the c and raising it to the d power modulo n and you will get back the message um now there are a, a lot of like conditions when this is secure and like how you have to choose these different um, parameters and so on typically n needs to be the product of two huge prime numbers that you multiply together and e can be uh, i think it just has to be like relatively prime to n so typically you choose uh, something like sixty-five thousand. 536 or something and there are a few other uh, uh you can choose m has to actually be padded in the proper way uh you can you cannot just take your message like convert it to a number and uh, right away there, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with rsa it's it's a it has a lot of pitfalls and i you know there you can make it a lot of challenges about this so uh typical things are it's like if e is chosen very poorly um or another thing like the whole security mechanism in rsa hinges on you not being able to factor uh, this number into its components so this is supposed to be the product of two huge prime numbers and if that's the case then you cannot factor this um i mean not before the end of the universe at least uh so that's something you could try and we could use uh program called sage which is like a um it's like a maths framework um 
it's based on Python, but they've added a little bit of uh, extra things and a lot of uh, libraries and stuff. So it's, it's really nice for doing some maths stuff. It has a factor function, so we can just try to take this huge number and try to factor it. And it turns out that this was not a product of two big prime numbers. It was actually a product of a whole bunch of small uh, numbers. So now we can use this to decrypt the message. So let's create a small script for this. So just call this uh, factors and copy this into our script. And we copy these parameters over as well. So uh, C here is our encrypted message. And it's in interesting that the n and e are in as decimal but c is provided as a as a sequence of bytes uh, like it's provided in hexadecimal so yeah um now we should just make sure that uh that these factors actually do add up to this n. So we just start by multiplying all the factors together and make sure that this that the product of that is the n that we was that we were given and that it is. Um, and now to calculate this so we want I mean we have c and we have e and we have n we need to calculate this D and the way you do that is that you need to calculate this phi function uh, and essentially as long as you have unique factors and they are prime then the way you do that is that you like calculate the product of like p1 times uh, sorry p1 minus 1 times p2 minus 1 times p3 minus one and so on for all the prime uh, factors. So let's do this. Um, and then um, we need to get to calculate the modular inverse and this is again like this is math stuff it's like textbook things uh, I won't go into the details I think there are like a ton of better uh, explanations on this on the internet uh, so basically you need to calculate this D by taking the inverse of E modulo this Phi uh, and then we also need to convert this um, this sequence of bytes we need to convert into a number and we can all use this bytes to long function to do that and then finally we should just be able to calculate this c to the power of d mod n and then we need to then convert this number that we get into a sequence of bytes and then we can print this And that gives us the flag and we can actually even so this is like a textbook example of what happens when you are able to factor the n in the uh, rsa uh, algorithm um so yeah that's uh, that's it and um, yeah, let's look at the next one. So this is called cryptic monkey business or 
I don't think that's a good translation, but yeah. Uh, so here we have some code. There's a server and there's a client and they're talking to each other. So this is, I guess, this is some kind of like man in the middle thing, maybe. Someone asked, someone's asking where Bob is. Uh, so Bob is not participating in this, uh, in this stream. Um, so let's download the code that we're given. some code um, okay so we have a client which will run this thing and it will perform this key exchange generate the key format the key encrypt some password send the password and then it will read some back some data and decrypt the flag okay cool and the key exchange is it will generate a random number between these two huge numbers and then it will take oh so dhg so this looks like a diffie hellman uh, key exchange uh it will send gx it will send that to the server and then we'll read back gy raise that to the power of the secret and this dh modulo and then i would get yeah so this is a diffie helming key exchange again uh like a standard uh concept in uh cryptography so the idea is you both choose the two parties that want to communicate they choose a secret they have a common base which is public everyone can know that and then you have a secret number each x and y and then you each raise uh, G to the power of your secret number. So like G X and G Y, and you can send that over the wire. And then you, you take what you receive and raise it to your secret. And that will then become G raised to X Y for both of you. And the idea is that knowing G to the X will not allow you to calculate X. So I guess the server, what is it doing? Yeah, it does the same thing. It generates a secret. It reads the GX from the client. It calculates um, GY. It sends GY and then it calculates the key by taking GX to the power of the secret. So it doesn't seem to be making any validations of the value that it receives. So I assume that we can then connect to these. Uh, so let's see what it does in the main loop. It does the key exchange, then it reads a password, decrypts the password, compares it against some secret password, which is redacted. And then if it's correct, it will encrypt the flag and send it to the client. So the idea is that we somehow like either like leak or forward the password from the client to the server and then we can get the flag and somehow decrypt it and the way we can do this is i think since it doesn't actually validate these parameters it should mean that if we look at the client first so it will generate this value uh, the secret value and calculate uh, GX and send it to us. We, this is kind of like a man in the middle attack, basically. And then it will read GY from us and then it will take GY to the power of secret. And that will be the key. Now, we don't know secret. But if we set GY to zero or one, both of them will work, then the, we know what the key will be because zero to the raised to whatever is still zero. So um, that should work. And then how is this key used? They format the key, which is from the library. Format key, 
So they do something in a loop here. But actually, if key is already zero, it just skips all of this and just pads it to a 16 with 16 bytes. So there will just be a, a sequence of, of 16 uh, null bytes. So, um, well, let's, uh, let's create a little bit of code then to, to do this. Um, so we have these parameters. So the client, let's try to just connect to the client first manually to see this happening. So it sends something. All right, it's hex encoded. So we send two bytes and we get something back. And now if we do this again and send zero, you see that this output and this output is the same because it's it has gen even though it, it the client generates a secret value randomly, uh, we give it zero. So it will raise zero to the power of whatever and it will become zero and the key will be the same. So um, we should be able to just uh, automate this so we connect to this uh, client and then first we can just re read one line we don't care about that value and then we send just one null byte and then we will receive back the encrypted password. Um, so uh, and then we can close this connection. So running this multiple times now, you see it's, we get the same thing back every time. So now we could actually use their own uh, functions to uh, just generate the key and decrypt this. So in our solution script, we can do like from lib import format key and decrypt. So we do key is equal format key of zero. And then uh, the password is decrypt which order was the argument? Um, first the message and then the key. So encrypted password. I guess we need to uh, actually, or will it do the bytes? No. So uh, we need to hex decode it. So we do that. And we should get the password. So let's try this. Um, thank you for the compliment on my uh, panel. And here the password is, this is not the flag, it's only used for authenticating the client, please look somewhere else. Okay, so that part works. So now let's just um connect to the server then and basically uh you know play the same trick so in what order does the server do things uh, it will first read from us okay we send zero it will 
generate this thing, send it to us, and then it will take GX to the power of secrets of zero. Okay, so we can just do this, but we switch around. So we send two byte, and then we read whatever they are doing. And then we should get the, uh, not the encrypted password is, no, well, wait, we need to actually send the password, right? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so what we could do now is that we could like encrypt the password again and send it, but actually we know that they're using the same key, so we can just send, um, We'll just send the encrypted password as we received it. But then we will receive the encrypted flag back. So we will just basically redo all of this. So what we're doing, we connect to the server. We send one null byte to make sure that they will calculate the key of all zeros. We then receive their uh, GY or whatever, we don't care. Then we send the encrypted password, which is also encrypted using the same key that we tricked the client into calculating. And then they will send the e encrypted flag, yes. And we will receive that decode it into sequence of bytes uh, and decrypt it with this uh, key of all zero and just print that out. Except I forgot to rename things. Also, I forgot to update the name of this of the challenge um let's run this again it did not work why is that oh sorry we Now we can just put on some debugging here to view all the traffic. Uh, it just sent in the file. So let's manually connect and just zero we should get the wrong password if if that would have been the issue so oh we're connect communicating uh, I forgot to update the code we're trying to communicate with this with the client still yes Okay, I'm just gonna remove the debug output um, to make it cleaner. And also actually Okay, so we have this encrypted password, we decrypt it to the, this password just to print it, then we connect to the server, we send this encrypted password because we tricked it using this null byte to calculate the same key, we get the encrypted flag back, we know the key and we can decrypt it uh, and get the flag. So what happens here is that the server and the client, they are blindly trusting um, the parameters that are being sent uh, across the wire. And it is true that the Diffie-Hellman key exchange if you have a, a passive man in the middle attacker, then it is secure. But if the man in the middle is able to like replace 
the things being sent, then you can have things like this. Also, um, I mean, the the server and client didn't even like sanity check the parameters, like getting this zero as a parameter, that's not reasonable. But either way, if you want to have this properly secured, then you need some kind of like signing mechanism to ensure that the parameters are actually coming from the right uh, source. Um, yeah, so that's it. We are going to the strange block. And I think, yeah, this would be a good place to Yeah, that will be a good place to wrap up um, uh, this. So I think we'll do this as the last one and then we'll do the forensics and the boot to root and the last web one uh, in a final stream. Yes, that's good. So let's do the last crypto challenge. Uh, did I download stuff? Um, so this strange block we have You find a block cipher something is familiar, but uh, Yet not uh, and you have this IP address and port and you need to add the flag format uh, around it So download the uh, code for the that's running on the server Oh. Okay. Uh, let's connect to the server. Okay. So, what happens here is that I mean, I will explain all of this very soon. And this is absolutely horrible. Uh, but um, what this thing does is that it will print this nice banner. It will get a random key. It will open the flag. It will initialize this AES um, object with the key and then for every 16 bytes in the uh, for every 16 bytes in the flag it will um, turn that into a number and then it will encrypt this number And then it will print that out. And then it will allow us to encrypt whatever we want with the same uh, key. So we can give it any, any block of 16 bytes, encrypt that and get the result back. So all of this above here is the AES implementation and AES is, I mean, it's a very well studied uh, encryption al algorithm that works by iterating a couple of different operations uh, a few times and one of the operations it does is called this uh, substitute bytes step so it will use this lookup table to substitute bytes 
but here the this s box has been modified so typically this would be this is a table 256 elements and basically you would look up like at let's say you want to substitute the value 14 then you would look at index 14 take that value and replace it with that but as you can see here the whole s box has been replaced by like the identity s box so the substitute byte step is actually not performed at all and i would bet that this is actually the proper aes box so the person didn't even bother to make this one uh, messed up but that should i mean that should render this the aes algorithm completely uh useless so i would assume that the the, the steps that we have in this um algorithm in this algorithm is the substitute bytes we shift the rows where we shift each row um this picture describes it very well uh, you shift it zero one two and three uh steps cyclically uh you you always operate on a uh, the as uh algorithm operates on a block of 16 bytes which you reorganize into like a matrix a four by four matrix that's the the model you have all the time and then the shift row steps, you shift them uh, zero, one, two, three steps. Uh, and the mix uh, column step, you uh, have, you basically, you multiply this matrix by, sorry, you multiply each uh, column by this specific uh, matrix. And then in the add round key, you just XOR in uh, the, this round key. Uh, that you have and the round key, each round key is derived from this initial key so we need to i mean i'm going to assume for now that everything else in this algorithm is like unaltered so that it's just the s box that has been uh, replaced um but still i'm wondering if this is an a challenge i should attempt at this moment um so what would the strategy be basically what we should be able to do that the, the high level strategy is that if we for example input a a block of all zero bytes then um the only thing that will affect the value of the output uh, are these round keys and we should then be able to if we do maybe like we should be able to create some kind of uh system of equations here if we input like all zeros and then maybe like a block where only one uh, bit is a set and uh, we can see how things uh, change so let's try like a block of all zeros first of all you know you see the same input provides the same output and now you see that uh, I did like a slight modification of of the input and you only get a slight modification of the output and this is why this is completely broken because you know in typically in in AES like changing just a single bit in in the input completely scrambles the output and that's part of what makes it uh, secure so Uh, 
question is then how do we is there any like fast and cheap way we could uh, get away with this um i'm thinking like um maybe we could we could run this i could run this locally with just known key and see how the how the key bytes and the input bytes um um affect each other and maybe we could do it completely uh dynamically in the worst case you have to like figure out all the different uh, relationships between the input bytes and output bytes and i don't think i want to do this uh, at the moment so let's in that case i'm going to like we're gonna wrap this up for today and uh, i will actually like prepare a little bit of material um before next time so that we can make this like a, a smooth uh experience because that would be like a lot of like working out things and uh yeah i don't think that's very interesting uh to watch uh so let's just try this where let's say how is this called um ugh. Um. Oh, okay. So you give it as a it's very strange thing. How is the key? We get a key. You provide us bytes, but the actual number you just provide us hex encoded string. Okay. So. Um. Then we print the yes encrypt of the message. So this should really produce just zeros because it's just um, Wait, doesn't this, how does this function work? Import secrets. Oh, okay, it gives you a number. Uh, okay, so this is also just, Uh, right, so it's actually not only just zeros because the this master key is then transformed into these round keys. So if we try these different keys, um, what happens if we just put the one in here? Yeah, it's shuffled around a lot. Um, It's a pretty nice challenge, but I think that this is a good place to... So, as I said, basically the idea is that we could actually add this thing here where it prints the round keys, I guess. Yes, so this is a bit messy to read. It should be each round key is one of these uh, four by four uh, matrices as well. So, oh.
and you do 11 iterations uh, of this. So you have these 11 round keys. And you can see that our key that was just, uh, sorry, it was a one there. Um, here is the all key, uh, all zeros key, but it does it does uh, become uh, an actual key. Uh, or sorry, I mean the the round keys are not just all uh, all zeros because there is the the way you derive the round keys um, uses this uh, like s box and uh, archon uh, arrays. So, well, okay, I mean, the, the S box is useless, of course, because uh, this is just an identity operation, but it does uh, XOR with this uh, Archon uh, thing. So, yeah. I think uh, no. I think the most the most like efficient and most entertaining for you is that we. I mean, we've been going on for almost three hours now, so I think this is a good place to stop, and I will just do some prep work before next time to make sure that we can do this in an efficient way. I will of course explain everything uh, and like walk you through any code and so on. But um, yeah, I, I, this is this requires a little bit too much uh, manual work to be uh, fun at this stage, I think. So uh, with that, we're gonna wrap it up for today. Day. If you have any uh, questions uh, or you know comments uh, about the, the, the stream, the challenges, uh, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will schedule a third and final session. Uh, maybe actually even already tomorrow because like all my other activities are canceled due to the current situation so yeah it's uh, hope you uh, enjoy the stream hope you learned something about these challenges and uh, yeah so next time we will do the, the the final crypto one the final web one the forensics and this boot to root sequence of, of challenges uh, so yeah uh, have a nice evening or whatever uh, time it is where you're watching from and uh, thanks for today.